Now, this is a really unique passage. It's a passage that I, that I really think in large degree it's talking about evangelism. Put another way, it's teaching us something about how we're to share our faith with other people in our lives who are not believers. Now, there are many passages in the Bible that talk about the importance of evangelism, the importance of sharing our faith. Uh, some of those you know. One, for example, we talk a lot about the Great Commission. It's uh, Matthew 28. And here in this great passage, right before Jesus ascends into heaven, he tells us, okay, I'm leaving you here with this mission. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I am always with you, or with you always to the end of the age. And so he's calling us. This is your calling. This is what you're supposed to do. This is not only the church, but the individual believers. Or Paul talks about the same idea in 2 Corinthians 5. He says, okay, you've received this message, now share it with others. Look what he says. And this is from God, through whom Christ has reconciled us to himself and given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciled the world to himself, not counting the trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God is making his appeal through us. He's entrusted this message to us. The king of all things, the, the king of the universe, and it, said, it basically said, okay, now I'm calling you to, to take the good news, the news of my message, and you're my ambassador. You're to call to share it. Now, I want to tell you that I will tell you there's a lot of passages that tell us that we should share our faith, but there aren't a whole lot of passages that tell us how to do it. You know, how can we, how do we do this? How do we approach someone? And that's what makes this passage unique. In this passage, we have our Lord and Master, Jesus Christ, giving us an example of how to approach someone and to talk about our faith. He's giving us principles that we can live out. That's interesting because you could take this passage and, and we can look at the, the chapter right before it in John chapter 3, and in both passages, we have discussions that Jesus has with people sharing the basic message of the gospel. In John chapter 3, we have Nicodemus. Here in John chapter 4, we have the woman at the well. But there's some big differences. In John 3, Nicodemus is a religious person. In John 4, the woman is not at all religious. But probably one of the biggest differences in John chapter 3, Nicodemus goes to Jesus and asks. Here, this woman isn't pursuing Jesus in any way. He initiates the conversation. I want to tell you, in my own experience, there have been very few times that in life people have come to me and ask me to share the gospel with them. It doesn't happen that often. It would be great if it did, but it doesn't happen that often. The challenge of evangelism is initiating that conversation and bringing up the issues of, you know, of spiritual truth. And what I, again, love about this passage is Jesus is modeling that for us. We see him initiating a conversation with a woman who isn't looking for spiritual truth. In fact, she wants to avoid spiritual truth. She didn't come to Jesus. She didn't pursue him because she heard that he was a great teacher. She heard about his healing. She had no idea who Jesus was. But he initiates a spiritual conversation, and he gives us principles that we can learn from and follow in our own lives. Now, we're going to go through this passage uh, you know, somewhat systematically, and I'll tell you we're going to go through it again next week and the other second half of it because there's a lot here. But I want to start with a few uh, introductory ideas. And, and that's, for starters, what we've got to see is that what he's, Jesus is teaching us here is taught throughout the Bible is that the gospel is good news for everyone. It's every, everyone needs it. The imagery that Jesus uses throughout this whole section is that of living water. Verse 10, Jesus he's told her, if you knew the gift of God and who is it that's saying, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Verses 13 and 14, Jesus said, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I give him will become in him a spring of, of water welling to eternal life. And he's using this imagery of, of water. And what I think he's saying here is this. You've got to re you realize how important water is for you. You realize that you get thirsty. We realize that, that as people, that, you know, the human body is 50% water. If you don't drink, it's not only a, a, a desire, a thirst, but it's a need. You know, we can go a month or longer without eating, but if we go up to three days, we can't last longer than three days without drinking. We need water. And what he's saying here is, my salvation, what I have for you, is as necessary for you as water is for you physically. 
that, that you know how much you need it, uh, phys- or physical water, but what you need to realize is that spiritually, you have a spiritual need that's just as real. And, and you have a thirst that's just as real. And, and this is something that is vital. And, and in that thirst, you can look for other sources. And there are places that you might go and you might drink and, and try to, be, to satisfy this deep need. But what you're finding is that all those sources, they might satisfy you just for a moment, but they're going to send you back and you're going to be even more thirsty afterwards. And so I'm going to come back to that, but that's what I want you to see from the beginning is that we've got to understand that what Jesus is teaching is this is something that is good news that everybody needs. And we're called to share it because everyone that we interact with that doesn't know Christ needs this gospel message as much as they need water to drink to survive. Now, when we think of this, we say, well, I may understand that. I might know that God wants me to share it, but, you know, it's hard because... We don't think we have what it takes. And and a lot of that is that when we think about the whole concept of evangelism, I think we often have false perceptions about what makes someone an effective evangelist. You know, I think in our mind, we have in our our ideas of somebody that we say, an evangelist, you have somebody in your mind that you think, oh, this is their personality. This is what they're like. And and we think of someone that's, you know, that's assertive, that's somebody that is, is, um, you know, aggressive, somebody that's going to, you know, talk you into things. In fact, I ran across something. It's an old uh, Peanuts cartoon. Charles Schultz was, was a Christian. And, and now this was years ago that you can't imagine this even being put in a secular uh, paper today. Uh, but it's a discussion between Linus and his sister Sally. And here you have, Sa- Sally said, I would have made a good evangelist. You know, what, uh, th- you know that kid who sits me behind me at school? And she continues, I convinced them that, that uh, my religion is better than his religion. Linus says, how did you do that? She said, I hit him with my lunchbox. <laughs> and sometimes we think that that's kind of what evangelism is. You know, it's, you've got to be aggressive, and you've got to just pound them into them. And, and, and even when we ask, I've to ask people in time, you know, when you think of an evangelist, what words do you think of? And, and, the, and the comments that I often get is somebody that's outgoing and dynamic and a dynamic personality and a good speaker, a great communicator. They're bold. They're uninhibited. They're assertive. They're knowledgeable. They can answer questions. They're confident in their ability to convince, and they push people to make a decision. And when we look at that, we say, well, I know I'm called to be an evangelist, but that's not who I am, so because I don't have that personality, well, therefore, God hasn't called me to do that. And, and the fact is, some of those traits, I'm not sure I really want to have. Well, let me ask you a different question, though. Let me ask you not, what do you think a good evangelist is? Let me ask you this. When you think of the person or the persons that were most responsible to lead you to saving faith in Christ, what traits define them? And see, when I ask people those questions, I always get the same responses. And whereas we might think, well, it, you know, an evangelist is someone who's outgoing and dynamic, and well, no, they so that person was loving and caring. We expect that they're a good speaker and they're a good communicator and they can argue. And no, we're told, no, these people were usually good listeners. We're told that usually they're bold and uninhibited. And well, usually the person that led you to Christ is probably more likely to be caring and compassionate. Well, we expect them to be knowledgeable and answer any questions and arguments. And well, usually those people that led us to Christ aren't like that, but they walk the walk. They have integrity. They live out their life. Usually we think that they need to be confident in their ability to convince, but in reality, it's, it's, they're usually humble people that are just faithful and their confidence isn't in their ability to convince, but in God's ability to convict. And usually, well, they're, we expect that they need to be gifted, and it's not that they're gifted, they're burdened for the lost. And, and so when you think about that, usually the person that was most responsible for leading us to Christ, and these traits are probably pretty similar across the, the board, are not at all like what we think of an evangelist to be. See, I, I think of the evangelist, I can't be that kind of person, but can you be the kind of person who was like the person who led you to Christ? Those are the traits that we have, that we want to have. And one of the things that you see here is when Jesus' interaction here, he's a whole lot more like that second picture. It's about relationships. It's him coming and building relationships with an intentionality. And, and, you know, and that's, that's what you see here. Is it's, it's, it's intentionality, but it's not aggressive. It's relational. But there's an intentionality that you see here with Jesus that he goes and he pursues this relationship. He pursues this woman. 
In, John, or in Luke chapter 15, we see Jesus teaching this idea and using several parables, and one of those is the good shepherd. And he talks about the good shepherd is one that doesn't stay in the, in the pen, but he goes out to find the one that's lost. So some, sometimes we can feel like we're passive. I, I, ran, I ran across, you know, there's a lot of evangelism t-shirts that people wear, and I ran across one that I know is intended to be humorous, but it's, it says a lot more truth. Here's, here's what it says. You probably can't read this. Here's what it says. Hello, I would like to invite you to church, but I'm terribly uncomfortable in doing this. Would you do me a favor and ask me about church? Thank you. <laughs> That's what we often do. We're kind of like, you know, come and tell me. And, and to put it another way, you know, I'd say we're, we're a little more like little Bo Peep. And we're not called to be a little Bo Peep. We're called to be like the Good Shepherd. See, we hope that someone notices our life and they come and ask us about faith. And, and when I say little Bo Peep, you remember little Bo Peep. You remember the, the little nursery rhyme? What does it say? Little Bo Peep has lost her sheep and doesn't know where to find them. Leave them alone and they will come home wagging their tails behind them. And so we say, well, there are people that are lost and so I'm just going to wait for them to come to me as individuals or as churches. And no, God calls us to be the example of the good shepherd of what we see Jesus doing here of going out and finding the lost. And we're going to see that. Let's, let's dive into it. It's a long introduction. But let's dive into John 4. And we're going to see some of these principles that I've kind of already introduced. They're the principles that for sharing our faith that come from Jesus' example here. And, and again, they're beautiful. Some of them I'm going to talk on you know, quickly because we've kind of already touched on them. But one that, I want you to, that we've touched on already is that, is that it's important to realize that evangelism is about relationships. You know, when Jesus goes to Samaria and he goes to that well, he doesn't just set up camp and start preaching, but he initiates a conversation and he builds a relationship. Evangelism isn't a process. It isn't a product. It isn't something that's just about preaching. It's it's, It's not about events. It's about relationships. He doesn't go hand out tracts. See, one of the things that has happened over time is that, and I know especially a, a, dec- or a generation ago, that you had people that were so committed to evangelism and they, they formulated a lot of these programs, Evangelism Explosion and Campus Crusade, and, and here's the night that we go out witnessing, and you're trained, and here's the program. And, and what happened is we began to think that evangelism was something that certain people do who are in that ministry on a certain night of the week. And what you've got to realize is that the vast majority of evangelism isn't done in a program. It isn't done through those, you know, the, the Tuesday night faith sharing times. It isn't done by Billy Graham. It isn't done by any great program. The vast majority of people are led to Christ by friends and family members and people that took the time to build a relationship. And so we've got to realize that that's what God calls us to do. You see it exemplified here in Jesus is that God calls us not to a program, but to relationships. He's placed us in the sphere of influence around people that surround us, that we have the chance to build relationships and to share our faith. And again, Jesus gives us some of these principles here, and he shows us how to do that. So it starts with relationships, and then it's understanding that the gospel is is God's, proclaims God's love for us and pursuit for us, for for the lost. Look at verse 3. Um, he left Judea and departed from, uh, again for Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Now I want you to notice something in this passage. I'm going to put a map up here. And uh, verse 3 tells us that he's going from Judea to Galilee. So he's traveling from south to the north, and he had to pass through Samaria. And that's that, that, um, you know, that colored part there in the middle. And you look at that and you say, well, that's the, he had to pass through there because that's the most direct route. However, what we know historically is that the Jews at that time were incredibly racist and really hated the Samaritans, so much so that it was normal when a Jew would go from one side to the other, they would usually cross over the Jordan River, cross around Samaria, and then go to either Galilee, you know, north or south. That was the normal path. So when we look at this and we say that Jesus says that he had to go through Samaria, practically he didn't have to go through Samaria. It was the most direct path, but he didn't have to go through it. In fact, when he decided to walk through Samaria, he was choosing not the necessary path, but the path that most people avoided. So what does it mean that he had to go through Samaria? It wasn't a geographic thing. It's saying that he had to go through Samaria because he knew that he had a divine appointment with a woman at the well. This is a woman that we're told that was out collecting water in the sixth hour of the day. 
Now again, we might say, well, when is that at the time? Well, their hours started when sun rose. So let's just assume that sun rose, you know, six in the morning that day. Well, the sixth hour of the day was noon. It was the warmest time of the day. It was in the middle of the afternoon. And the fact is, is that no one went out to get water at noon. You didn't go and get water when it was hot in the middle of the day. You would go get water in the morning, you know, as the sun was just rising when it was cool. Or you'd go right before sunset when it was cool again. The only reason that anyone would go there in the middle of the day is because they were trying to avoid people. If they were a social outcast and and, and they knew that they would be rejected by other people, so you would go when no one would be there so that you could avoid people. And what we find is we're going to see that this woman was, you know, was, you know, was had multiple marriages and living with someone, and, and she was almost certainly seen as someone that was a social outcast, someone that, you know, that morally was outcast. And, and so here's this woman who's rejected by all, and what does it say? That Jesus had to go through Samaria. Why? Because he knew that, that there was a woman that was there. There was a divine appointment, a woman who had been rejected and scorned by her peers, but was of great value to God. And Jesus went through Samaria because he was pursuing her with the message of grace. Now, my friends, I want you to realize that this is not a story about how God worked then. It's a story about how God works to this day. You see, I've talked with people over the years, countless conversations with people. And, and, you know, and, and I can say, based on that, pretty much everyone here, no matter where you're at in your relationship with God now, you can look back over your story and you can see times that you realize now that God was pursuing you. Even when you were wandered from him, even when you were in rebellion from him, you can see times that, that God was clearly pursuing you. There were times that you did something that could have killed you or destroyed your life, and, but God somehow intervened. There were times that there was a key moment in your life where God sent someone to do something, to say something, to get your attention, and to remind you of of some truth. There were times when someone stepped in and provided just what you needed at that moment, or when God worked in some amazing way, and deep down you knew it was God pursuing you, even if it was at a time that you were running from Him. We all know that. We've all experienced that. In fact, for some, it may be true today that you're here. You're not sure why you're at church today. You're not sure how you got here. But you need to realize that God brought you here because he's pursuing you. He's chasing you. That just as Jesus said, okay, I'm, I'm, I had to go through Samaria. No, he brought you here because he wanted you to be here. He wanted you to hear his, the gospel message. Now, some of you need to hear that. God's pursuing you. There's others that need to hear another piece of that. How does God pursue people? How does God reach people? It's through relationships. And what we need to realize is that that if that's true, God has put you in the lives of the people around you because you are the means that he seeks to use to bring people into relationship with himself. He is pursuing the people around you and he's doing it through you. I talk to people all the time who, again, will tell me about a family member or a friend, and, and we're praying for them, and suddenly they're like, oh, man, this person, this coworker, this friend reached out to him. They invited him to a church. They invited him to a sports league. They did something, and, and suddenly they're open to the gospel, and, man, we prayed, and, and I'm saying, that's an answer to prayer. That person's an answer to prayer, and what we need to realize is that each one of us are an answer to prayer to other people's, you know, other people's loved ones. That God has put you and me in the sphere of influence that we interact with people that, that we're the way that he's pursuing them. And are you willing to take that mantle up and say, no, God's pursuing people through me? Am I, called to be fa- am I going to be faithful to that? Well, as we are, then we're called to see, and again, the third principle from Jesus' example is we need to approach unbelievers with a spirit of humility and affirmation. Now, again, remember what we've already begun to see. This is a woman who's out there in the sixth hour of the day. She's avoiding people. She's almost certainly a moral outcast. She's used to being shunned. And here you have Jesus coming to her. And let me pick it up in verse 6. Jacob's well was there. Jesus was worried as he was from his journey, sitting beside the well. It's about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. And the Samaritan said to him, How is it that you, Jew, asked me for a drink from from me, a, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. 
Now here he's looking at it and saying, first of all, I know that you're totally prejudiced against me, and, and Jews will generally not talk to Samaritans at all. They avoid us. So number one, you're talking to me, you're speaking value to me. Number two, you're a man and I'm a woman, and generally men don't speak to women. Men look down to women in that culture, and, and not only that, we're going to see that Jesus knows that she's a social outcast, someone that everyone in her own community rejects. And she's speaking to, he's speaking to her, and in doing so, he's valuing her as a person. He's coming to her, and he's speaking to her as an equal. He's affirming the value of her man, humanity. And that's something that the majority of the people, even in our own sphere of influence, wouldn't do. And what we've got to realize, friends, is that, is that we interact with people, and at times they will say, well, you need to prove my sin. You need to, no, we don't approve their sin. And Jesus didn't. But he, he valued the their, their person. He looked beyond her sin. He looked beyond all the things that people rejected her for. And he valued her humanity. And he communicated that. And not only that, but then he asks her for a drink. Which is, again, I think really interesting. Because if you think about it, he could have just started the conversation. Why did he start by asking for a drink? Because in doing so, he actually put himself in a place of humility. He actually put himself in a saying... You have something that I need. Will you help me? And again, I think there's something that is really significant here. See, a lot of times if you talk to non-believers and what they think of Christians, we can seem prideful and arrogant. We tell There are times that it's not only important to affirm who they are, but if we can't even ask for something, if we can put ourselves in a place of humility. If I want to interact with a non-believer and if, if there's things that they know that I don't know, if I can ask for their help, you know, what I'm trying, to, I'm, I'm trying to communicate through that, I don't know everything. I don't, I'm, not, I'm not superior to you. In fact, I'm willing to put my places where I'm inferior and, and I'm asking for you to help me. And there's a humility there that oftentimes opens up the, you know, the doors for the gospel. Where I think about people that I interact with that, again, are non-believers. And if I can find areas that in their life I can affirm, you know, boy, you know, I'm not going to say what you're doing wrong, but boy, if you're doing a great job as a dad, if you're doing a great job in this area of life, if you're, you know, boy, I really respect the way that you work. If, if I can affirm those things, you see, what I'm doing is I'm affirming them as a person. And I'm opening up a relationship. I'm building a relationship that opens up the door for getting into the gospel. And that's what you see Jesus doing here. Not only that, but we see in this relationship, he's, he's building relationship that's this relationship, it's not confrontation and condemnation. And again, when you think of who this is, he could have gone to her and said, well, let me tell you why you're wrong as a Samaritan and why your theology is wrong, why your, why your behavior is wrong. And he doesn't do that. What does he do? He comes and asks this question. He affirms. And one of the things that, again, we've got to realize is that as we interact with people that don't know Christ... Sometimes as Christians, we can get so, you know, we can, you know, we can judge the behavior and condemn the behavior. And hey, listen, I think about it, and if I didn't know Christ, my life would be a mess. I mean, I'd hate to think about who I would be. And so if someone doesn't have a relationship with Christ, if they're lost, why should I be surprised that they're acting like they're lost? Why should I be surprised that an unbeliever is acting like an unbeliever? Why should I look down for them for that issue? You know, what I do is that I value and appreciate them for who they are. I'm not condemning, you know, think of what John 3, 16, we love John 3, 17. Christ didn't come to condemn the world. The world stands condemned already. He came, his message was a message of grace. And again, it doesn't mean that we, you know, that we affirm the wrong be sinful behavior when we're pressured to do that. If we do that, we're removing the grounds of God's conviction. Jesus doesn't affirm wrong behavior. But he does affirm her as a person. And he doesn't condemn her or look down at her you know, even, even as a person, even because of her behavior. But at the same time, he also looks to this opportunity to turn to spiritual issues. So he's talking about drinks, and he, and he, and he says, okay, how do I turn it to a spiritual issue? How do I talk about living water? And, and we're called to do the same thing, to build that relationship, but, but then turn it to spiritual issues. Now, I will tell you, in, in my own experience, the one that I think has been most effective to me you know, there might be times that you pray and God just gives you this idea that you just think about, okay, well, I can do this, and here's this illustration. And, and if God gives that to you, then use it. But I'll give you one that I think is pretty much across the board safe. You know, you say, well, I can't bring up spiritual issues. They'd get mad, or they're, they're not closed, open at all. And you know what people are generally open to? When you say, how can I pray for you? 
I mean, I've had atheist friends that I'll talk to and I'll say, well, I know you don't believe in God, but I do. And, and one of the ways that I can serve you is that if I pray for you, and I know you, you don't think it does any good, but if you could tell me how I could pray for you, it would, it would give me the, it would allow me to serve you in a way that I think that is significant. And they, they can't get mad at me for that. Usually he gives me like, you know, he'd give me like a, an, an empty response and but then I'd come back to him every month. Say, I'm praying for that. How's that going? And, and then what happens is when there's some kind of need, guess who they call? I remember a guy that I had witnessed to, and this guy was a Hindu. And again, he doesn't believe in what I believe. He's a Hindu. And so, but I'd ask him, how do I pray for you? How do I pray for you? And one day I get this call in the middle of the day, and he almost got in an accident. He just had somebody sideswipe him. He almost died. And the first thing he does is get on his phone, and he calls me. Because suddenly he was aware of a need. And he was aware of this guy that has been saying he'd been praying for him for a couple of years. And suddenly it was like the doors opened. So if there's no other way to turn that thing to a spiritual thing, start with just, how can I pray for you? And then look for God to open up doors. Now when you do, also realize that we need to be willing to be attacked and defended. Look at what it says in verse 9. You know, Samaritan woman said, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealing with Samaritans. And Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it was that was saying to you, give me a drink, you would ask him and he would have given you living water. And the woman said to him, sir, you have nothing, uh, you have nothing to draw water with. Is water deep? Where did you get the living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us his well and drank from it himself. His son stopped. Now, now you look at this and Jesus just said, give me a drink. And next thing you know, it's like, why are you talking to me? And are you better than, and it's kind of like, you know, Jesus could have been like, man, back off woman. I've just asked for a drink. You know, it's just like, what's your problem? And the fact is, when you look at this response, I mean, she's like, pretty, pretty aggressive reaction. And sometimes we get into a spiritual thing and we get that response and we almost get people, if you bring up an issue and it's like, man, I don't want to start a fight. And what we don't know is we don't know other people's religious experiences. We don't know what they're coming out of. And, and so they might be reacting not to us, but to someone else. And beyond that, they may be reacting to the fact that deep down there's something in there that they know God is pricking. And suddenly we represent Christ and, and God is pricking away at their heart and suddenly they're reacting because they don't want us to get close. I mean, I think of a great example of this with my parents. You know, when my parents first started to attend church, you know, you know my dad came to Christ and and, uh, and Sue Burnham, the pastor's wife, started to reach out to my mom. And so she goes to my mom and she says, well, I'd love to get together with you. I'd love to have lunch with you and just talk. And, and my mom looked at her and she says, I have six kids. I'm too busy to do things like have lunch. You know, it's just kind of like, just wham, just sh- shut the door. And, you know, and my, and my mom looks back now and says, man, I was so rude. I was so, but she was putting up these defenses. And instead of saying, man, I'm offended, Sue just continued to reach out to her and eventually led her to Christ because she persevered. In fact, what we need to realize is that oftentimes people that respond with hostility toward the gospel do so because their heart is tender. Oftentimes the people that are most angry, that are most difficult, aren't doing that because they hate what they hear, because they're they're closed. It's because God is beginning to work on their heart and there's a tenderness they're trying to run away from it. So don't give up. When they're they're totally hostile, look at that and say, God might be working. In fact, they're more likely to get more hostile before they eventually surrender than than they are less less hostile. But even when they're hostile, we need to realize that we we need to tell the truth with grace and sensitivity. And that's what you see Jesus doing here. And he comes and he talks to this woman. He talks about this, this, you know, this, you know, if you, if you ask me, I would give you living water. And, and she says, you know, I said, sir, give me this water that I won't be thirsty or have to come here to drink water. And he said, go get your husband and, and tell him to come here. And the woman said, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you're right in saying I have no husband, for you've had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you said is true. And the woman says, sir, I perceive you're a prophet. And so he comes and he, he, he speaks truth. And what we've got to realize is that sometimes the truth is not what people want to hear, and sometimes that truth is revealing our, our need. And in our culture, especially, people will say, if you ever touch on issue, any issue of morality, well, you have to accept me, you have to approve this, you have to approve. No, the thing is, is that again, if we approve it, what you're saying is, no, you're not broken and you don't need Christ. And when we speak truth, I'm not looking down at you or condemning you, I'm saying, we're all in that same category. 
But we have to speak truth. Jesus Christ was truth with grace. He spoke truth to this woman, but in a way that was not condemning. And here's what we have to realize, is that in the midst of this, when he's doing it, it's showing us an incredible truth that we said beforehand, and that is that the gospel is the truth that people need. Here's what I want you to realize. I mean, this is something that, that it was just wonderful to be able to even see this, this, uh, you know, this week, is when she comes and he says, you know, you know, you know give me this, you know, um, you know, what is this water? You know, she says, you know, give me this water that, you know, that I won't ever have to drink again. And then he goes and he says, well, give me your husband. And it seems like this total nonsense, you know, it's a uh, thing that's unrelated. I can't remember the word now. Um, you know, it seems oh, totally unrelated. You know, kind of this ADD moment. You know, it's like here and we're talking, going here. And it's like, what does that have to do with that? And, and here's what I want you to realize. He's not changing subjects. He's answering the question. But in a way that she doesn't want to hear it, but that she needs to hear it. She's coming and she's saying, what is that water? Give me this water. You know, if I have this water that I never would be, well, give me this water. And, and he says, okay, well, let me, when he says, go get your husband, what he's saying is this. This water is the thing that satisfies you, that fulfills you, that meets your deepest need. And right now you're looking for that water and you've been looking for it in relationships and sex and men. And as a result, you've been married five times and you're going from one to another to another and you keep coming back because it's not satisfying you. You know that you're thirsty, you know know that you're, you're, you're passionate, you know it's not working. And so he's not saying changing subjects, he's saying, what is this water? Well, let me tell you what you think the water is and let me show you it's not working. And what we've got to realize is that he speaks this truth and it's something that is true for each one of us. That we've got to look at it and we've got to say that the truth, the fact of the matter is that all of us are created with a God-shaped void. All of us have this deep, deep need. And the question in the midst of this deep need there's all these things that people are going to try to fit in, fill in. And, and, and if you say, well, it's wrong. It's, well, how dare you say it's wrong? But it's not working. Your life isn't working. You're going from, in fact, what happens is we take this drink and, and, you know, and we need more. We need, to, we need to ramp it up. We need something bigger. We need something better because we realize that we're still thirsty. We're still, we're still needy. We're still hungry. My friends, The message that Jesus says here is true for each one of us, and it's the truth for the message that we share to each person. And it's a message that each person needs. We have that video. I'm going to skip it over today uh, just because of time. Um, We have a video that I'm I'm not going to deal with to share, but it's an unbeliever who talks about somebody who shares with him. And, And this guy's an atheist. And in the middle of this, of this thing, he's reflecting back and he's saying, this, this person that shared with me knows that I'm an atheist. And he said, but I'm not bothered by that. And he basically said, if you believe this is true, if you believe there's a heaven and a hell, then how much do you have to hate me to not tell me about it? And for you to say that, you know, that I, I don't want to offend somebody, well, to say that I know that you're going to hell, but I don't want to risk offending you, so I'm not going to tell you that. How much do you have to hate me to do that? The fact is, here's a believer, somebody who's not a believer who understands something about the truth that we sometimes miss. God's put us in the lives of people because they desperately need it. And just in close, let me just challenge you. A practical challenge to pray confidently and act in patient faith. How do we do this? You see, even with with Jesus, he felt there was a need. He had to go to Samaria. There was a sense that he knew he was called to this woman. You know what I think we start with? We're going to talk more about some of these ideas next week, but I want to just challenge you to start with at the core. Start by saying, who in your life has God put you there that are not believers that he thinks he might be calling you to breach? Who do you have an opportunity with? And pray for them. Pray for them regularly. Pray for them on on a regular basis. We're about to have the week of prayer. Think about the people that you're going to put on that wall and and get the church praying for. Let's start praying for those people. You know what I love about the week of prayer? We've yet to go through a week of prayer where we haven't had someone who was like totally close to the gospel come to know Christ during that week of prayer. Prayer works. So who has God put in your life? Start praying for them. Pray for them regularly. Get your small group. Get other people praying for them. And then pray likewise, God... Look, show me opportunities. And whether it's turning a message to the gospel or asking them, how can I pray for you? Or inviting them to a volleyball league or to an encore thing, to, you know, to, to, you know to, to Easter when it comes, where they're going to hear the gospel. Whatever it is, look for the opportunities and let God work. And 
realize that God is, if you're here, if God doesn't, if you don't have a relationship with God, God is pursuing you. If you have that relationship with God, God is pursuing the people around you and he's put you in their lives so that he's going to pursue them through you. Are you willing to, are you willing to be faithful to that call? Thanks for joining us. If you have any questions about what we talked about, Jesus Christ, our church, or anything else, connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, or by email. We'd love to hear from you.